Um, I am Pradeep. Uh, I've been, uh, I'm a second year PhD student working with uh, Professor Tabi Bazar at the University of Utah. I have been working with MEMS resonators and uh, this is one of the interesting projects I've been working in the past, uh, past one year. So here's the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with a brief overview of the existing MEMS gyroscopes and then uh, talk about the advantages of using the HRG or the uh, existing MEMS gyroscopes and then I'll discuss about our approach and the design and working principle used in this, go in detail over the fabrication steps and then uh, show some testing results and then the uh, simulation used here to interpret the data of uh, the experimental data. Uh, we also have some results from the angular rate sensing that I'll be going through and uh, then we'll finally conclude. So the basic working principle of uh, any gyroscope is uh, just to detect uh, Coriolis effect experienced by a freely suspended mass and uh, the existing uh, MEMS gyroscopes have different designs in which they detect this in the form of cantilevers, tuning forks and uh, as, as complex structures as a gimbal. The best results that, that have been obtained so far are with the interdigital electrodes and uh, this is also the reason why they have been commercialized. Analog device, devices have commercialized these and uh, there are many chip sized gyroscopes available with this and they perform at the rate of like 300 degrees per second. Uh, the quadruple ma mass uh, interdigital electrode gyroscope fabricated at uh, University of California Irvine uh, can detect angular rate as, uh, as great as 100 degrees per second and they also show a very high resonant frequency, uh, very high Q factors but this was performed under vacuum. Uh, this is where the trade-off comes in. So uh, a regular gyroscope uh, based on a suspended mass would require air cushioning to protect it from shock uh, due to any impact. Uh, but for a high, highly sensitive measurement, you, you would require it to operate in vacuum to obtain a high Q factor. So this is where the HRGs uh, come into picture. HRGs have been, uh, the hemispherical resonator gyroscopes have been the uh, device of choice in uh, aviation and space exploration. Uh, this is mainly due to their highly uh, high Q factor and the, the robustness. So they can withstand shocks up to uh, 1000 Gs or uh, greater in a, uh, in a vacuum environment. And they operate in wine glass resonance mode. Uh, the, the macro scale devices which are of the 30 mm diameter from uh, the Northrop Grumman can exhibit Q factor in excess of 20 million. The only down downside with these existing thing is it's bulky, so it's not suitable for on-chip mounting and they are very expensive because they require a lot of precise micro-machining and also hand assembly. So our attempt here has been to uh, make this process inexpensive and uh, uh, make it a MEMS based process to batch fabricate this. So here's the design, we uh, fabricate this shell within the substrate. Uh, and provide electrodes in pairs around the rim for excitation and uh, sensing and this is how uh, the the device is going to be working in so it's a four node uh, wine glass resonance mode. Uh, the fabrication steps start with the four, a four inch bare silicon wafer. Uh, we, we deposit a, a hundred nanometer silicon nitride mask layer to uh, protect it or, or yeah, to protect it during the isotropic etching process. The isotropic etching process used here uh, uses a mixture of hydrochloric acid and nitric acid in the mixture of 1 is to 9. Uh, th this mixture was chosen uh, based on the work reported here. Uh, so this can control the etch rate with, with uh, precision of 1 to 2 microns per minute and uh, they have known to produce perfectly hemispherical structures. So they have been used to make molds for uh, very precise micro lenses. So following the isotropic etching, we uh, oxidize this thermally to create an etch stop during the etch, etch, etch release in the final step. Uh, and following the oxidation, we deposit aluminum electrodes on this and pattern it. Uh, the sacrificial layer, which is a sputtered silicon here, is then deposited. We use a one micrometer thick layer here just to make sure it's conformally coating on all these edges. and. Uh, the, finally, we deposit the device layer which is sputtered silicon dioxide. We targeted 1 to 2 micron thickness but we stopped at 1 micrometer thickness because the stress, residual stress would become prominent as the thickness increases. 
finally, the devices uh, were patented and released in a xenon difluoride etching. Here's the SEM pictures of some devices. Uh, so this this was uh, taken. These pictures were taken before the electrodes were uh, patterned. So this was from a different batch. But uh, here's the optical picture of uh, final device with the electrodes visible there for sensing and for sensing and actuation. Um, to check the profile scan, uh, to check the cross-sectional profile scan for the sphericity, we uh, ran a SEM scan and then we curve extracted the side profile. Yeah, uh, so the blue line that you see here is a, a curve extraction using MATLAB of the SEM picture uh, contour. And uh, we compared that against a uh, locus of a perfect semicircle. And the correlation gave us a sphericity of uh, greater than 90%. So the deviation here may be due to some residual stress, which is playing a picture in changing the shape of the structure. We also did a surface characterization to check the surface roughness of the uh, sputtered silicon layer. Uh, so and the, obviously, due to the shape of the, the the shape of the device, we couldn't run it all along the device. So we focused in the pedestal region and assumed that the Roughness would remain the same at the other regions as well. The su surface roughness ha showed some spikes, random spike, which is expected due to the nature of sputtering. Uh, but the overall surface roughness was uh, less than five nanometers. So uh, for testing, we used uh, pairs of electrodes for uh, excitation and sensing. So when one of the electrode was uh, used as a excitation electrode, the other acted as a sensing, and vice versa. We tested both of these. And uh, here's the testing setup uh, with a custom-built vacuum chamber. All the uh, testing was performed in a vacuum chamber. So the devices we tested here were of uh, 500 micrometer diameter. We tested different uh, diameters. This was very necessary because uh, in the fabrication process, we have uh, isotropic etching and uh, the ped uh, pedestal creation step, which, which are very critical, and they define the yield of the process. Uh, and uh, depending on the yield of the process, we were uh, we got best results with the 500 micrometer diameter uh, devices, and uh, the central frequency of these devices were in the range of 20 and 22 kilohertz. The Q factor was uh, not as high as, as expected, but uh, it, it wasn't still bad. So these tests were performed under rest and uh, we see no separation in the degenerate modes. So uh, these two curves that are, that are shown here are from different electrodes, the orthogonally placed pair of electrodes. So one of them was used for sensing, the other was used for the detection. So when the frequency uh, scan was performed at a lower uh, scan rate, we see a separation in the degenerate modes. So this can be attributed to uh, a change, some kind of irregularity or asymmetry in the shape or in the thickness of the uh, hemisphere. So to quantify the uh, degree of asymmetry, we ran some ANSYS simulations. So the first task was to find out the elastic modulus of the silicon dioxide use. Silicon dioxide, as is known, uh, exhibits a wide, variety, wide range of uh, ENS modulus based on its growth or deposition technique. And uh, uh, we use the same uh, thickness and all the geometry size of the actual device to find out the ENS modulus for a resonant frequency of 22 kilohertz. And it turned out to be like 33 gigapascal. And then we placed uh, a point mass on different regions of this uh, hemispherical structure to find out the to, uh, to find out the exact frequency split that we obtained from the experimental results. And uh, we found the effect of the mass to be prominent when it was on the antinode of one of the sectors. So uh, for a 5 hertz frequency split, uh, we required a 10 micrometer cube block of silicon dioxide to achieve that frequency split. And uh, the frequency, the reason for asymmetry can be explained with the misalignment here. So uh, the final step that defines the uh, the hemispherical structure itself 
could be misaligned by one or two microns, which actually results in more mass present in one part of the hemisphere than the other. And uh, we did some uh, testing to uh, find out the angular rates. Uh, we actually used the uh, separation of the degenerate modes to find out this. So uh, we had this HRG mounted on a, a chip which uh, was connected to a rotating disk. And uh, we did alternate measurements with the opposing pair of electrodes, with the orthogonal pair of electrodes. And uh, we see a split in frequency, uh, we see a difference in the frequency from two pairs of electrodes, which is indicative of the angular rate of rotation. Now, th there is further test required to exactly quantify this rotation rate uh, in relation to the frequency, but uh, that we, we are currently working on that. Uh, so to conclude, we have uh, successfully used the planar micromachining uh, CMOS techniques to uh, construct 3D hemispherical shells, and these exhibited 90% uh, greater than 90% sphericity with less than 5, 5 nanometers surface roughness. The Q factor uh, that we achieved was greater than 10,000, 10, which is not as high as expected, but uh, uh, we are improving on the uh, fabrication techniques to improve this further. Uh, the simulation results gives us an insight on the device behavior, and uh, we uh, demonstrated uh, use of separation in degenerate modes to determine the angular rate. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the students of Professor Tavi Vasar's group and Professor Mastrangelo's group uh, for all their technical help and suggestions, and uh, the uh, staff of the NanoFab Utah. And uh, uh, on behalf of all the authors, I'd like to thank the DAP HRG program for providing us an opportunity to work with this uh, pro interesting project. Thank you.